Exmoor has drawn visitors to its beautiful moors and valleys for many decades and was finally made a national park in 1954. For the majority of its history as a holiday destination, the herds of Exmoor ponies were simply local animals that were especially pleasing to the eye for the visitors. Part of the aesthetic attraction of the moors they roamed. However, since prehistoric times, the Exmoor pony herds have actually been hard at work helping to maintain and safeguard the Exmoor landscape. Their importance as a positive factor and useful tool in land management was not recognised until the mid-1980s. It was then that the National Trust Warden, Jeff Han, was faced with the problem of ensuring suitable and sufficient grazing for Seacombe Valley, a chalk grassland reserve near Swanage in Dorset. He hit upon a pioneering solution and introduced free-roaming Exmoor ponies. This particular farm we're on is Easington Farm and it's Seacombe Valley that we're actually on at the moment, which is a natural limestone uh, grassland. And uh, we had a bit of a problem here with a, with a particular grass which is called Brachypodium pinnatum. To the English it's tor grass. Um, this is a very invasive coarse grass that just grows like mad. And what it does in the winter, um, it dies off and lays down a thatch. Now this thatch is quite, um, quite strong and, and the only thing that will actually penetrate it afterwards the following season is actually the Brachypodium again. So it blots out everything else. Now there's certain things in particular that we have on this, this area. We have um, a thing called an early spider orchid and we have several other orchids like bee orchids, uh, pyramidal orchids. In the early 80s we tried sheep um, because sheep were supposed to be the best graziers for conservation and all the rest. Well, they didn't do a lot to the Brachypodium and also they're very fond of eating the spikes off the, off the orchids. So as they regenerate by seed, um, it's a bit difficult if the flower's gone for the plant to reproduce. Um, so then we tried cattle they were doing quite well, but the trouble is the cattle only have one set of teeth and they pull things and when the grass gets a bit older it gets a bit coarse, they don't like it. Anyway, years ago I bought an Exmoor pony for my children to ride. What I did notice with that pony is it wasn't so keen on the nice lush grass, it would then go into the rough stuff and, and eat the rough grass and I thought, well, hang on a minute, this is what this is, so let's have a go. What I started, I contacted the um, Exmoor Pony Society um, and got the secretary, who then put me in contact with the National Park Authority, and then I managed to buy five young fillies and a mare, which I then brought to, to Seacombe. If you look down across the valley, you can see this sort of rough grass there. And um, what the ponies are doing is actually eating the thatch out and doing very well. And this is what the other animals wouldn't do. They wouldn't pull the thatch out. And uh, the ponies are doing very well. They're very good at the restoration side of it. Um, and now we've gone from restoration into maintenance. This, this is what it's all about. It is producing a short enough turf like we've got here to produce this flower that we've got here, the early spider orchid. And of course, you know, it's most important in this area because we've got 10% of the British population. Um, and as you can see, if you look at the flower, you know, it's in shape of a spider, the, the body of a spider. Hence, it's called the early spider orchid. And it's one of the earliest orchids that, um, that actually flowers. So, you know, these are doing a good job. And as we've seen, the ponies are all walking all the way around them. They haven't eaten any of them yet. Um, and they're producing the habitat for these to flourish. Jeff's new recruits proved highly successful. The current improved distribution of the early spider orchid within the reserve owes much to the power of Exmoor pony teeth to control the sward. Word spread within the National Trust and beyond. Exmoor ponies have now become an indispensable management tool in a variety of habitats throughout the British Isles. English nature uses Exmoors on several reserves, including Aquilate Mere in Shropshire. It is a far cry from either the Purbex or the High Moorland of Exmoor. However, Warden Tim Colshaw decided to experiment 
and see if Exmoor ponies would adapt and achieve the necessary grazing regime. Originally we were thinking of looking at traditional breeds of cattle um, and then a local person suggested the idea of Exmoor ponies to me because the County Wildlife Trust uh, had got three or four Exmoor ponies which they were trialling on some of their nature reserves. But what we weren't sure about first was wh how well the ponies would do um, in a grassland situation because eight years ago people were starting to use Exmoors in habitats similar to Exmoor, so sort of upland heathlands, but we weren't quite sure how well they would do on places like this. So it was a little bit of an experiment, but it's one that we've been well pleased with the results. At the National Nature Reserve here at Aqualate, we've got about 200 acres of lowland damp grassland like this, full of quite coarse grasses, rushes and sedges. And one of the problems that we had when we first came here um, was getting the right sort of grazing animals to, to graze this pasture, which needs to be eaten down to quite a short sward height if it's going to be really useful for wading birds and the other um, plants and insects that you'd find in this area. And one of the problems we found is that the, the modern breeds of beef cattle used by farmers don't really do well on this sort of ground. So after several years of trying, uh, with um, local herds of animals we decided that we were going to look for something to, to graze ourselves and we decided on native ponies because they need much less looking after um, than cattle or other domestic animals and we went for Exmoors in particular because of all the native races of pony um, Exmoors are the hardiest and would therefore re hopefully require the, the least looking after um, all year round really. The, the lake and all the, the landscape around here uh, was formed during the last ice age and it had of course been at that time that animals very similar to our current Exmoor ponies would have been roaming across Britain as the native wild pony. So really these ponies are, are grazing a landscape which they have been grazing for tens or hundreds of thousands of years. We, we originally acquired our Exmoor pony herd purely for use as a grazing tool and as a, a very sustainable way of managing these grasslands. But one of the nice things about having Exmoors here in that as well as them doing a job for nature conservation, we're actually helping to conserve the breed of Exmoor pony, um, which you know, is nice that we can contribute to that. I think that the other nice thing um, for us as non-horsey people has been uh, what characters these ponies are. And um, each one has an individual personality, which we've discovered as we've been filming this afternoon. Um, and they really are very endearing and, and, and very popular with the, um, the people that do get to see them here. Small groups of Exmoor ponies are to be found on reserves in many counties of Britain. Exmoors are also used for conservation grazing in Germany, Sweden, Holland and Denmark. For the population of Birmingham, one herd of Exmoors is right on their doorstep. Sutton Park, situated in Sutton Coalfield, is a country park of 900 hectares that again presents many management challenges including establishing suitable grazing. Birmingham City Council decided to introduce Exmoor ponies in 1999 and the management team has been amazed at both their beneficial environmental effect and also at the public reaction to the ponies. Park manager John Porter explained the pony project to a group of visitors also involved in land management. The ponies have been doing, been doing interesting things um, for example, uh, we had a bit of an uh, invasion of, of bramble in one part of the, the area and uh, we've actually seen them sort of pouring the bramble roots up and eating the brambles and even eating, uh, eating the gorse and the bracken. <laughs> Jumping on that, not They do like bracken, yeah, so, uh, so they trample it. As you, this area here, just behind us, has uh, had a lot of action on it. You can see it's sort of broken away. And, and they are a natural way of... Uh, of minimising the impact of bracken. If we got the sort of scale of bracken that there is on Canna Chase, which has got that way because grazing has ceased, we would be uh, we would be strained with badger lots and stuff like that. But we're at, at the moment we're we're in a position where mechanical action is, is doing the job for us. And the ponies just just get on with it. We don't have to uh, uh, do much at all. Yeah. The only maintenance really that we do in this this huge block of land is is to maintain the fences to keep the ponies in <coughs> it, um, and then we're felling some trees and there's almost uh, we're very close to a sustainable way of managing this this land here and it's very cost effective uh, having 20 odd ponies doing 485 hectares um, 
it's looking after itself. It's a, it's a, it, it, it is a, a, a great way to go forward, I think. It's better than having, you know, people all the time using chainsaws or mowing or, or whatever. We think that's a, a higher risk and intrusive activity. Uh, if we get the grazing pressure right in the, in the next few years, perhaps with more animals, this will look after itself for, for large periods of time. And that is the best sort of uh, amenity, really. We've, we've got a system which uh, will be more pleasant than uh, a heavy industrial forestry type situation. But we do a fantastic thing for sort of wildlife, because um, in some places you'll find the heather's other sides all yeah. the same sort of age and height. We, if you have a look here, you can see they've broken some down. We've got short heather, long heather, yeah. little hidey holes for creatures, uh, you know, creepy crawlies, insects, all those sort of things. And it's just a wide variety of little uh, habitats in one yeah. site. And the ponies do that. <laughs> we just have to look after the ponies. Yeah. The reaction you've just had to these ponies, it's about quality of life and well-being. And it's just, it is a joy at times. It brings a lot of um, peace into people's life. This location with these animals, you step off the rat race, forget your troubles, and you can come to a place like this. And it, it just does a power of good. It's, it's, it's those intangible things are hard to measure sometimes. You'll, you'll hear Latin names and ecologists talking and archaeologists, but, but isn't that just a fantastic thing to see? Local people in, uh, are involved with a voluntary pony uh, warden scheme, so there's a, there's a whole lot of people who live just around here who come in every day uh, and they're just walking the dogs and doing what they're doing. Yeah. And they know the ponies, all those on an individual basis, and they watch, watch them for us. So you find yourself, as a manager of a site, with a whole load of voluntary effort, which is doing the job for you, because people love these animals. It is a way of uh, managing these landscapes and involving local people. It's fantastic. As in so many instances, the ponies bring benefits beyond just vegetation management. They are appreciated in their own right. It may be assumed from these examples that Exmoor ponies are abundant, However, widespread does not mean plentiful. Exmoors are in fact very rare, with just around 2,900 in total in 2006. Of those, the breeding population is only about 500, with about 200 foals born a year. For this reason, the Rare Breed Survival Trust categorises Exmoor ponies as endangered. Increasing that breeding population to a more secure size of gene pool depends on generating more demand for Exmoor ponies. Increasing their use in conservation grazing can therefore play a significant part in conserving the ponies themselves. So why are these animals proving so useful in the context of conservation grazing? Exmoor ponies are an ancient race that probably first arrived in Britain over a hundred thousand years ago. The relevance of this is that the ancestors of today's Exmoors had their characteristics shaped by thousands of years of natural selection. The result is a pony that can and does live in balance with its environment. Exmoor ponies have highly efficient teeth. Their incisors as meat like pliers to give a clean bite that does not tear or damage plants. The molar teeth are large and deeply rooted, well able to cope with chewing coarse plant material. All this allows them to have a varied diet. The pony's selection of plants varies according to vegetation type and seasonal availability. In summer on Exmoor, when grasses are plentiful, these are preferred, but not to the exclusion of all else. Rushes and some heather are also eaten from the moorland menu. They eat only a very small amount of bracken when the fronds are fully grown. In winter, gorse becomes a very important food to compensate for the lack of grass. and the amount of heather eaten increases too. Exmoor ponies have evolved to live on food plants of low nutritive value. It can therefore sometimes be the case that moving them to very different habitats 
that offer a much higher proportion of rich grass places them in a situation where they might get a painful condition of the feet called laminitis, which can be very serious. This is usually more of a challenge in keeping them in domestic fields. However, it is again a factor to consider and in some instances electric fencing is used to divide up areas to be grazed and so restrict intake to some extent. This ability to adapt to the changes in vegetation is a key factor in the Exmoor's success. At a suitable density, they can live on nature reserves without overpressuring the habitat as with some domestic stock. Their willingness to eat coarse grasses yet leave wild flowers for the most part untouched is particularly useful. Providing a suitable water supply is naturally of fundamental importance. On Exmoor, the ponies will utilize rivers, streams, dew ponds and puddles. If reserves do not have constant running water, and water has to be provided, this can prove expensive and time-consuming. The hardiness of the Exmoors and their ability to exploit natural shelter means they can graze areas all year round. Providing artificial shelters is not always necessary, depending on the features of a reserve. Out on Exmoor, the ponies can find shade from the sun from small hawthorn trees, yet do so relatively infrequently. They shelter from wind and rain behind gorse bushes and hedges, and even in dips of the lie of the land. Each reserve, therefore, needs to be evaluated in terms of what natural shelter is available. Another factor to consider in the case of lowland habitats is their resident midge population. Members of the horse family can be allergic to midge bites. A small proportion develop a distressing condition called sweet itch, where the mane and tail are rubbed extensively, leading to hair loss and sores. Finding out which individuals are suitable for such habitats is a case of trial and error. Generally, it's advantageous to have Exmoor ponies that will not approach people on the reserve. This is why the majority of conservation grazing exiles come direct from free living groups and are unhandled. Hard feet and a generally robust health mean that exmoors usually require infrequent intervention, but when needed, it presents the challenge of how to provide farriery or veterinary treatment to unhandled animals that may be roaming large areas. Catching a free herd is the first hurdle. In some cases, groups are deliberately established, including a few ponies that have been lightly handled and will at least be lured by a bucket of food, with the others hopefully following their lead. Essentially, this is an aspect of running a herd that has to be carefully planned before unhandled ponies are brought to a reserve. In some instances, ponies are not liberated onto a large area initially, giving time to establish the team of helpers as suppliers of food. Ideally, if suitably skilled helpers are available, ponies may be handled to the stage of accepting a head collar once in close confinement, but retaining an unwillingness to actually allow close approach when free. At Sutton Park, the team of helpers has adopted an interesting psychological approach to achieving the dual aims of ponies that keep their distance, yet will allow certain people to lure them into captivity. They need to be checked on a daily basis, and we have a yep. couple of members of staff who, who are oh, passionate about it, really. And, yep. and once you keep these animals, you fall in love with them, and it becomes a great privilege to work with oh, them. Me, and yeah. you do, you just sort of, you bond with them. Yep. But ponies are exceptional in, in the sense that um, 
we keep them wild. Oh, are they not, they're not visitor friendly then? No. Oh. And, well, occasionally, if you, if you come along uh, to Sutton Park, you might find me in the middle of a field with a with a horse crop and a and a very loud oh, yes, yes, yes. and I go around scaring the ponies. So yep. they, they they remember that uh, they don't want to get too friendly oh, with people. Yep. We've taken some away that have been too friendly. We, we don't want any pony that you can go up to and touch. Oh, right, right. We, we make them keep their distance. Yep. The problem then is when we do have to treat them or check them over. Take a bit of catching. They do take a bit of catching. Yep. And they know one or two members of our staff uh, by sight quite well. Oh, I see, yes. And, and we encourage them to wear high visibility jackets. And the ponies are, 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 are oh, associated with this, yes. with this uh, image. And when we do want to round them up, We'll, we'll get some pony nuts. Oh, yes. And those, yes. those individuals will, will start Lead to feed them a bit. Yes, yes. Uh, and, and make particular noises, and the ponies start to follow. Mm. So we are now at the point where, well, we know we've got to run them up. It'll take us two or three weeks, but we'll, we'll yeah, retrain yeah. them yes, yeah. Yeah. to, uh, oh, to yep. follow, mm -hmm. do what we've got to do, and then afterwards, somebody else, not these same people, it's normally me, goes around it's alarming them again. and scaring yes. oh, them. And, yep, uh, yep. So it's, uh, right. yeah. Yeah. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a gentle process. Whatever system of catching ponies is used, very strong handling pens are essential. They must permit the separation of an individual from its fellows into a closely confined space where the farrier can trim its feet or the vet can provide treatment. The sides of this part of the pen need to be solid so that a completely unhandled pony cannot get a leg trapped if it struggles. It is also important to be able to load into a trailer or lorry from part of any pen system. Just as untamed ponies require strong handling pens, they can only be enclosed onto a reserve with very robust fencing. These are very intelligent animals and will quickly identify any point of weakness as a potential route to better food supplies outside. Another aspect of management is the question of worming ponies on reserves. On Exmoor, some herds are never wormed. In some cases, treatment is given once a year at inspection time. With the prohibition of certain wormers on nature reserves because of concerns about their effects on invertebrates, one option is to routinely send pony dung samples for analysis and monitor this against condition, only intervening if a problem becomes evident. Useful information on the various management systems in use and the experiences of a variety of conservation grazing schemes can be obtained from GAP, the Grazing Animals Project. Their contact details are given at the end of this film. In managing Exmoor ponies specifically, one factor is the ability to identify individuals as they are so similar in appearance. Some registered ponies are branded, some microchipped. Unregistered ponies may have neither. Microchipping is very helpful when the ponies are closely confined, but can't help when they're roaming free. This is where it is important to have helpers who get to know the ponies very well and learn to recognise the physical differences and the animal's personalities and behaviour. Exmoor ponies attract public interest once people get a chance to see them. They can be a useful focus for educating the public about the importance of reserves and the conservation work of the owning bodies. If the ponies were asked for references, the Exmoor National Park Authority would attest to the importance of the ponies in the moorland ecosystem. It is easy to overlook the fact that the ponies have played and continue to play a vital role in maintaining Exmoor as it is. Their sustainable relationship with the environment underpins the DEFRA ruling that registered Exmoor ponies are allowed to graze environmentally sensitive areas all year round and do not have to be removed as with domestic stock. National Park Ranger Alison Kent found ponies at work on Haddon Hill on Exmoor following the burning of an area. Well you've got a really good example here where we've been doing some swaling and you can see the ponies are moving in to munch up the charcoal bits of gorse and they play a very very important part in managing a lot of our land, well a lot of Exmoor, where places where cattle and sheep really don't want to graze, the ponies will go in and browse and they do an excellent job.
I think there's a big future for Exmoor ponies, particularly now the um, payments for farming have changed and I think we're going to see less livestock, cattle and sheep, out actually out on the moorland and therefore there could be a big opportunity for more ponies to be put out on the moorland to help manage it because you must, you must manage moorland, it's no good, you can't neglect it, if you do it'll just revert to shrub and woodland in a very, very short time so they've got a vital role ahead. Exmoor ponies have much to offer those who are responsible for managing the land, its flora and fauna. Using them as guardians of the land is such a satisfying strategy. They help to maintain suitable habitats for plants, insects, birds and fellow mammals. At the same time, they're also helping to secure their own future.